from 1959 through 1986. He served as a speaker for three terms in the Oklahoma House of Representatives from 1973 to 1978, only the second person in history to do so. The Willis Lecture tonight is co-sponsored by the NSU Department of History and the department's chair, Dr. Ian Anderson, will be interviewing tonight's guest speaker. Dr. Anderson, as you will soon hear, is not from around here, but comes to NSU from England, receiving his PhD from Indiana University. He has taught at NSU for over five years and has published articles on various aspects of African-American music, including jazz and slave music. Our featured guest speaker is Hannibal B. Johnson. He is a Harvard Law School graduate, an author, attorney, consultant, and playwright. He serves on numerous boards and commissions, including the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission and the National 400 Years of African American History Commission. His books, including the most recent one, Black Wall Street 100, chronicles the African-American experience in Oklahoma and its indebitable impact on American history. His play, Big Mama Speaks, a Tulsa Rapes, Riot Survivor Story, was selected for the 2011 National Black Festival, excuse me, the National Black Theater Festival and has been staged in Switzerland. Hannibal has received numerous honors and awards from his work, and community service, and we're so honored to have him here with us tonight. On a personal note, I have heard one of Hannibal's presentations, and I know we are in for a wonderful evening with, a, with great information and a very powerful presentation. Please welcome Hannibal B. Johnson in conversation with, doc, with NSU's Dr. Ian Anderson. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Turner. Um, I would uh, remind members of the audience today to please uh, submit your questions using the question and answer function on Zoom. Uh, I look forward to drawing upon some of those during the course of this evening. Hannibal Johnson, thank you for joining us for this conversation about um, the Tulsa Race Massacre and its contexts and legacies uh, as we commemorate its 100th anniversary. When and how did you become interested in this history? I moved to Tulsa in the mid 1980s, at, just out of law school, and I began working for a law firm here in Tulsa. I actually grew up in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is about 100 miles southeast of here. I really knew, knew very little about Tulsa and certainly nothing about the African American community, the Greenwood District, Black Wall Street. So when I got here in the mid 80s, I began work, got engaged in the community. Soon I was asked to write a regular guest editorial column for the Black newspaper called the Oklahoma Eagle. I did that. At one point, I was assigned to do a multi-part series on the Greenwood District, the African-American community. Did that, became really interested in the history, and ended up writing a book called Black Wall Street, From Riot to Renaissance in Tulsa's Historic Greenwood District that debuted in 1998. So we're talking about events that center on the historic district of Greenwood. Can you tell us a little bit about that area, um, where it's located, uh, how it was founded, and who were some of its uh, prominent early citizens? The historic Greenwood District in Tulsa is a roughly 35 square block area. So if you've been to Tulsa, it's bounded by Detroit on the west, the Midland Valley Railroad tracks on the east, Archer on the south, and Pine to the north. What we're talking about is the segregated African-American community and business district created beginning in 1906 by a fellow named O.W. Gurley, a transplant from Arkansas who had come to Oklahoma in the land run of 1889, um, moved over to Tulsa in the early part of the 20th century, bought some land, kept some for his own purposes, created a couple of businesses, sold parcels of land to other people. And what grew from that was uh, what I call a Black Main Street as opposed to a Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street is the moniker attached to the community. 
But Wall Street really conjures up investment and banking, and that's really not what this was. This was like a, a small town business community. So you would have grocers and restaurants and movie theaters, dance halls, pool halls, haberdasheries, barber shops, beauty salons, laundries, all manner of small businesses coupled with service providers, a concentration of doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, etc. This was the Greenwood District as a business and entrepreneurial community. Again, a community of necessity. It existed because African Americans were not able to engage with the white dominated economy of downtown Tulsa because of segregation. So they, they took an economic detour back to their own community, created this successful economic and entrepreneurial haven. So where does the term Black Wall Street come from? Black Wall Street is just a reference uh, reference to the, to the business character of the district. And it actually wasn't Black Wall Street in the beginning. It was the Negro Wall Street of America. It was a term that is credited to Booker T. Washington. We know that Booker T. Washington was in this area a fair amount, visiting Bowley, visiting Muskogee, visiting Tulsa. So he was aware of this community. And in fact, he promoted communities like this, both, both successful, segregated Black business communities like the Greenwood District, like Black Wall Street, but also the Black towns like Bowley. Because for him, these were signals of African-American um, acumen in business, industriousness, ability to self-govern. And he believed that ultimately, if Black folks were able to demonstrate these things to the white folks who controlled the nation, then racism would abate. Because, because white people who are in positions of power and authority would realize these are human beings too. They have the same capacities as we do. They want the same things as we do. So there would be no logical or rational reason for racism. Problem is racism is by definition irrational and illogical. So where does the story of the Tulsa race massacre begin then? Um, I mean, we know that the trigger is an incident in an elevator in downtown Tulsa in the Drexel building between uh, uh, Dick Rowland, uh, uh, African-American uh, shoe shiner, and uh, Sarah Page, a young white girl. Um, what do we need to know to understand how this event led to the loss of probably hundreds of lives and, and the, dis the devastation of this prosperous Greenwood district? We need to know something of American history. So we need to know the national context in which this event occurs. We need to understand that just two years prior, 1919, the summer and fall of 1919 was referred to as Red Summer, a term coined by James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP. Red is a metaphorical reference to the blood that flowed in the streets of American cities, towns, and hamlets, really all across the nation because of racial tension, racial unrest. These were called race riots, but they were largely assaults on black communities. And they happened in places like New York and Philadelphia, Omaha, Chicago, Elaine, Arkansas, and Washington DC and Longview, Texas, all over the nation. There were more than two dozen of these so-called race riots in 1919 alone. And contemporaneously, there was lynching. Lynching is essentially domestic terrorism. Lynching is the, the, the summary extrajudicial uh, punishment of a victim or victims, mostly black, often by vigilantes, white mobs, often in public spectacles witnessed by men, women, and children, uh, often in brutal, heinous fashion. So we're talking about hangings, shootings, dismemberments, burnings, castrations, it's horrible. It, it, and, and, I, and I am listing the modalities because it's so horrible that we must know about it. So that's the context in which the racial violence in Tulsa occurs, coupled with the fact that in Oklahoma in the early 1920s and progressing throughout the decade, the KKK, the iconic domestic terrorist organization had a foothold in Tulsa and in the state. There was also Another factor, a factor I call landlust. And that simply means that 
the land on which the black community sat was desired, envied by other interests in town, including the railroads and industrialists. There were conversations prior to the massacre about moving the black community farther north and using that land for other purposes. What pe people in the railroad industry and in, a, in the industrial complex considered to be higher and better uses. Add to all that the media. Now, we have great conversations about the media in 2020, no less so in 1921. There was a media outlet called the Tulsa Tribune, a daily afternoon newspaper that published a series of incendiary articles and editorials that really fomented hostility in sectors of the white community against the black community. That really is this complex web of things that were going on that created a Tulsa, which was a tinderbox or a powder keg, needing only some sort of catalyst or igniter to set the community afire, aflame. Yeah, it's, um, you know, reading in your book how, um, how quickly the mayor and the city council started talking about um, putting the land to, to different uses right after the, the events of, uh, of early June. I mean, I think within a week, uh, there were already proposals uh, uh, for, for, for uh, rezoning and uh, new fire ordinances to discourage sort of residential use and so on. So those were conversations that were continuations of conversations that had begun earlier. Yeah. So can you tell us how events unfolded then and, and help us understand the scale of the devastation? So we've established kind of the context, both nationally and locally. So we need a match, an igniter, a catalyst. We get that beginning on Monday, May 30th, 1921, which happened to be Memorial Day. It's an incident that curiously involves two teenagers, Dick Rowan, a 19-year-old black boy who shines shoes downtown, drop out from Booker T. Washington High School, Sarah Page, a 17-year-old white girl who operates an elevator in a downtown building called the Drexel Building. Dick Rowan needs to use the restroom. He knows that there's a restroom available for his use. His options are limited because of segregation. He knows there's a restroom in the, in the Drexel Building. He walks over to the Drexel Building, boards the elevator. Something happened on the elevator. We don't know exactly what, but it's likely that Dick Rowland bumped into, brushed up against, or stepped on the foot of Sarah Page. In any event, she overreacted. She began to scream. Dick Rowland, understandably, was frightened. So when the elevator landed back in the lobby, he ran from the elevator. Sarah Page was distraught. She exited the elevator. She was comforted by a clerk from a nearby locally owned store called Renberg's. He was concerned because she told him of being assaulted on the elevator. He called the police. She later would recant that original story. She would refuse to cooperate with prosecutors after Dick Rowland was arrested for the alleged assault. That might have been the end of the story had it not been for the intervention of the Tulsa Tribune. The next day, which would have been May 31st, 1921, the Tulsa Tribune published an article entitled Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. It was a false narrative. It was a tale of an attempted rape in broad daylight in a public building in downtown Tulsa. The article went out of its way to make Sarah Page look virtuous and as a corollary to make Dick Rowan look villainous. It had its desired effect. A large crowd of white men assembled on the lawn of the courthouse. Dick Rowland was being held in the jail, which sat atop the courthouse. The white mob numbered ultimately in the thousands. There were murmurings and rumors of lynching. A mob was going to seize Dick Rowland from the jail, take him out to a public space and lynch him. Black men got word of these rumors, assembled several of their number together, several dozen ultimately, got some weapons, marched down to the courthouse. Some people in the black group were veterans of World War I. They knew how to use their weapons. So five, six dozen black men approach this thousands strong white mob. Words are exchanged between the much larger white group, the smaller black group, a white man tries to seize a gun that a black man is holding. 
the gun discharges, according to survivor witnesses, all hell breaks loose after that. The violence lasted roughly 16 hours and it was quelled in the early afternoon of June 1st by a unit of the National Guard sent in from Oklahoma City by the governor. When the dust settled, we believe that somewhere between 100 and 300 people were killed. Now the official death toll has been 37, 25 black, 12 white. That is almost certainly a gross undercount because of record keeping issues, because of summary, summary burials, both individual and collective, the possibility of mass graves, folks being injured and dying elsewhere after having been wounded in the disturbance here in Tulsa, all manner of reasons. We believe somewhere between 100 and 300 people were killed. We know that hundreds more were injured and that property damage conservatively estimated that at the time was $1.5 to $2 million, which translates into present value double digit, at least double digit millions today. We know that at least 1,250 homes in the black community were destroyed as were a number of businesses and churches and other structures. We know that a number of black folks in the community were rounded up and detained in internment centers, very much like people of Japanese ancestry were interned during World War II. And the Red Cross directed by Maurice Willows who was sent in from, from St. Louis provided the immediate relief, health, healthcare, food, shelter, clothing, there were a couple of downtown churches, First Presbyterian Church and Holy Family Cathedral that also assisted with immediate post-massacre relief. It was a devastating, traumatic event for the Black community, but the rebuilding began almost as the embers still smoldered from the massacre. That is the remarkable piece here. It's the indomitable human spirit. Now, you used the term massacre just now, um, but that wasn't always the nomenclature used. Um, what's in a name? Um, how might we think about the language that we use to describe these events? Yeah, massacre is a, is a term of, of relatively recent vintage. The last couple of years or so, folks locally and nationally have referred to the event as a massacre. Historically, if you look at the document, it's referred to as a race riot, as were similar events all around the, the country. But, but there's been a, a recent effort to sort of um, reclaim the framing of these types of events. And the term settled on was massacre. I have a particular nuanced philosophy about nomenclature. My emphasis is on critical thinking. So when we see something designated as a race riot, like in Tulsa 1921, we should ask ourselves, who named this event? What is the purpose or reasoning behind the naming? And in Tulsa, we know that race riot has significance because many insurance clauses have um, race riot exclusions, right? So that there's a, a clause called a force majeure clause that says, if your damage happened on account of a number of things, including riot or civil unrest, we won't pay proceeds to you. So riot has significance. Ask yourself, who was absent from the table and probably should have been at the table when the name was, was given out? Ask yourself, once you know the facts of what happened, once you know what happened on the ground, what are terms that might have application? So if we look at what happened in Tulsa, let's, let's look at riot. Riot, yes, it was a riot in some senses. Is that a strong enough term? That's, that's up for debate. Massacre, yes, it was a massacre, certainly in some sense of the word, but does massacre diminish the fact that there was active resistance among black men in the Greenwood community, at least for a short period? They were overwhelmed, but there was active resistance initially. Pogrom is a term that we could we could look at. It's mostly a European term, but it has to do with this notion of um, dis, dispossessing and displacing people from their land. And we know, based on the conversations that we've already talked about, that that was under consideration. Holocaust. Holocaust is destruction by fire, right? And that's exactly what happened in the context of the events in Tulsa in 1921. 
ethnic cleansing and genocide are terms that we talk about mostly in the context of, of, of Europe, but maybe they have application as well. Assault is a, is a very generic term, but it has application. Um, some people have referred to this event as a white riot, using the term riot, but being careful to point out who perpetrated the riot. And then the final question we should ask in terms of nomenclature is, if this event were to unfold on our soil today, what would we label it? So basically, I, I, I'm proposing a, a five-pronged critical framing of, of this nomenclature question. For me, it's important that we think about what we're saying. It, it's less important what we settle on. I use the term massacre because I have to be able to communicate with people simply without going into this whole, I can't make this explanation every time I use the, the, the term or refer to the event. So I have to sort of settle on this. But when I'm given the opportunity, I want people to think about the critical thinking aspect behind nomenclature. Well, thank you for helping us to think through that uh, for, for ourselves. Um, I'd like to go back to um, someone you mentioned earlier, Booker T. Washington. So Greenwood became an identifiable African-American enclave during the first decade of the 20th century, as you've explained. And, and you pointed out this is a time of, of Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement uh, and also widespread lynching. And we know that African-American intellectuals and leaders advocated a number of different responses to try and deter discrimination and violence. So Ida B. Wells, for example, spoke about uh, armed self-defense, among other things. Uh, Booker T. Washington, as you pointed out, urged people of color to uh, live with segregation in the short term uh, while making themselves useful and acceptable. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, urged race leaders to demand full citizenship and to pursue those rights through the court. Do you think that events in Tulsa shed any light on the viability or the limitations of some of these strategies? Yeah, I think the strategies are often presented as in opposition one to, to another, but, but I don't think they're actually in opposition. So, so I think it is entirely possible to lobby for one's political rights and, and citizenship rights while operating within the system to create economic gain while simultaneously resisting violent onslaught with self-defense. It's possible to do all those things. They're not necessarily at odds. Um, it, it really is on emphasis and priority. That, that, that's really the difference. I think, um, so W.E.B. Du Bois, the intellectual, was much more interested in making sure that America was true to its professed ideals. Booker T. Washington saw economic capacity as something that might actually gain those citizenship rights because of the power that comes with economic heft. And Ida B. Wells simply sort of believed that because of the incredible violence against African-Americans, it's certainly within our rights to defend ourselves. And, and actually Du Bois believed that as well. I mean, he talked about having a Winchester at the ready if necessary. He was, uh, he was actually present during the Atlanta riot um, and talked about having his, his gun. And if anybody approached him uh, in the wrong way and he had to use the gun, he would use it. Right, and I believe Washington also was active behind the scenes in, in sort of funding uh, uh, court challenges, legal challenges to segregation in various jurisdictions, yeah. So what happened to Greenwood after the massacre? You, you know, unfortunately, I think so many people, when they hear the story about Tulsa, they fixate on the, mac the massacre. And so they understand that there was this bustling black business and entrepreneurial community that was devastated, destroyed in 1921. And the study, story kind of cuts off at that point. That's not the end of the story. The overarching story is the story of a community and a people. The massacre is an event in the context of a people's history. 
the Greenwood community was rebuilt bigger and better than ever post-1921. In 1925, the Greenwood community hosted the national meeting of the National Negro Business League. That was the Black Chamber of Commerce founded by Booker T. Washington. The peak of the community as a business and economic community is the early to mid 1940s. There were well over 200 black owned and operated businesses then. The community subsequently declined in the 60s, 70s and through the 80s for a number of reasons. Most notably integration, which seems counterintuitive and urban renewal, which locals call urban removal. Now I talked about the community being a community of necessity, meaning that the reason that, that the dollars were trapped in the Greenwood community and circulated and recirculated among black businesses was because black folks couldn't engage with the regular white dominated economy. But that really fostered the success of black businesses for black people. So when integration comes along, something that black people lobbied for one of the unintended consequences is that it undermines the financial foundation of black business communities because of the nature of economics. Because a Walmart outside the community has much more merchandise available at much better price points than a mom and pop shop can offer. Because there are clients for doctors and lawyers outside the community. They might want to be more accessible to those clients by moving out of the community. So all these reasons undermine the financial foundation of the Greenwood community as a business and entrepreneurial community and begins to decline. And then the city begins looking at what was called urban blight, dilapidated properties. The community is declining because of integration, because the financial foundations undermined, properties get boarded up, they're on the list of the city to take care of. Urban renewal comes in, prop properties are bought out. Interstate, in Tulsa at least, Interstate 244 is directed right through the heart of the Greenwood community, takes out more properties. This happens all over the United States to BIPOC communities. And so the decline is substantial over that period. Yeah, I was struck by, um, in, in reading uh, Black Wall Street 100, how not only did uh, city leaders blame uh, African Americans for the Tulsa race massacre, but years later, uh, I think in 1959, when the city decided to move ahead with urban renewal, there seems to be a similar sort of blaming of blaming of the victim. It, 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 urban renewal was couched as as uh, taking care of, of blight, as, as you say, and addressing the sort of the moral shortcomings. And, and I, I mean, it, it, it's framed in very moralistic terms. Um, so the, the 100th anniversary of the massacre, it sort of offers an opportunity for us to reflect upon Greenwood's present and future. What are the prospects for, for Greenwood today? What, what does the community look like today, sort of post-urban renewal, uh, uh, post, um, post uh, uh, de, de jure uh, uh, integration? Um, yeah, what, what does Greenwood look like today? The Greenwood community today is really in the midst of a renaissance. That might sound a little odd, uh, but it's, it's not a renaissance as a black business and entrepreneurial mecca. It's a renaissance as a fully integrated community, both in terms of race and both in terms of the nature of the entities that are here. So it's, it's a residential, commercial, educational, entertainment, cultural, religious community. It's fully racially integrated. Much of the land is, is on, owned by TDA, the Tulsa Development Authority, the successor to the Urban Renewal Authority. The biggest kid on the block is Oklahoma State University, Tulsa campus. Um, so it, it, it is just a mix of entities seeking some sort of branding or common identity. And one of the things that we've tried to do through the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission is bring those entities together under kind of a com common umbrella. And one of the things that I I feel good about saying we've, we've accomplished is that 
virtually everybody realizes the importance of celebrating the history of the community and leveraging that history to create something positive for everybody in the community today. So we're building Greenwood Rising on the uh, southeast corner of Greenwood and Archer, which is kind of the gateway to the community. Across the street is Green Arch, which is um, a multi-use facility that has apartments on the top and restaurants and other shops on the, on the bottom. There's another a complex, multi-purpose complex coming up just west of there. One Oak Field, the minor league ballpark where soccer and baseball are played is right across the street from Green Arch. There are historic buildings on the 100 block of Greenwood and Archer, buildings that were rebuilt after the devastation in 1921. In fact, my off I'm sitting in, in one of the buildings in my office is the Botkin building, which was built in the 1930s. The Greenwood Cultural Center is just to the north, as is Vernon AME Church and Mount Zion Baptist Church, both historic churches that were here uh, during the period of the massacre. Uh, there's a campus of OSU Tulsa, campus of Langston Tulsa, OETA. Um, there's John Hope Franklin Reconciliation Park, which was built about 10 years ago, a place for reflection um, on, this, on this history and a place to bring people together on common ground to think about reconciliation. So it's, it, it's a community that's working on unity and identity. Yeah, and th that really sort of, um, it, it makes me think that, you know, despite this, this rebirth, which you, which you described so well, um, the massacre truly was a, a, a devastating event for the city, for the community, for thousands of individuals. Um, you describe it in your book as a, a historical trauma. What are we on the way to making the city whole again, or, or you know, what does it take to make the city whole? We're really talking about, for me, we're talking about a three-part process. So the, the three parts, and alliteration is important to me. It's one of my favorite devices. So. Acknowledgement, apology, and atonement. So acknowledgement, acknowledgement has to do with owning up or fessing up, as I would say, to our history, which includes the imperative of reforming curriculum such that it is embedded in what we teach our kids in successive generations. So that's one of the things we've been working on through the commission, including creating um, a summer teachers institute now we're actually doing more than one Teachers Institute these days. We're doing a day of learning in connection with the Centennial. We're working closely with Tulsa Public Schools, which is working on uh, curriculum enhancements K through 12 to infuse this history in various disciplines. So that, that's, that's really an imperative. We, we, we created a documentary through the Centennial Commission. Our website has lots of information. We have curricular resources on our website. It's www.tulsa2021.org. So that's part of the acknowledgement piece. Apology has to do both with literal apologies, I'm sorry for, but also creating and generating a sense of compassion and empathy for people who have suffered historical racial trauma. Now we've had some public apologies, most notably our former chief of police, Chuck Jordan, about eight years ago, I believe, apologized on behalf of the Tulsa Police Department for the police department's dereliction of duty back in 1921. Because we know that law enforcement officers deputized some of the people in the mob that destroyed the Greenwood community and killed people in this community. So he issued a public apology, very powerful. But we all have to think of ways to instill in, in our brothers and sisters, compassion and empathy for people who suffer the lingering effects of, of historical racial traumas. And there have been many, not just in Tulsa, but all over, all over the nation. And I think you were, fundamentally, you're getting at the atonement piece. What is it that we do to make amends for the past? I think the answer is complex. What we do is a bundle of things. 
And so it may involve, for example, paying individuals who were the victims or the or their the heirs of those people cash payments to those individuals, cash payments to, to survivors and heirs. Uh, that was something that the, the first commission, the Oklahoma Commission to Study the Tulsa Race Right of 1921, they recommended that back in 2001. There was a lawsuit filed in federal court in 2003. It wasn't successful because of statute of limitations, but the lawsuit argued for reparations for the living rights, mass right, or then it was riot, riot survivors or massacre survivors we would say today and heirs, people who had lost property. So that, that's one form of making amends is to, is to pay people um, damages um, that as best we can equate with the losses incurred. That's one way. But there are also communal type reparations that are important as well. Curricular reform is something I've already talked about. Building something like a Greenwood Rising, which is a history center that memorializes the history and creates opportunities for people to come together and leverage the lessons of history to confront current challenges that we face around race. John Hope Franklin Park, that's a form, a communal form of re reconciliation because it's, a, it's about, or reparations, because it's about bringing people together, um, having them contemplate issues of race and racism and think about ways that we move forward together in a positive way way. Investments in the Black community specifically, targeted investments e economically, that, that, that could be a form of, of reparations. The devil's always going to be in the details and, and sort of how do we calibrate and calculate these things. But conceptually, there are, again, individual forms of reparations making repair and communal or community forms of reparations. We should consider all of them and we should have some sort of process by which we uh, come to some sort of consensus about what we prioritize and where we're going. And I should point out that consensus, does, it, consensus isn't unanimity, right? Consensus is a process whereby we, we have a structured format, we evaluate, we make some decisions and we agree to abide by the decisions that are made, that's consensus. Do you come across people who say, you know, it's time to move on? Why are we still, why are we still talking about this? It's been a hundred years. You know, no, no one in my family. I didn't do this. Why do I, you know, why should I be thinking about that? Uh, I was wondering if you you come across that and 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 how you respond to that. Yeah, let, I come across it less frequently than I used to, than I would have twenty years ago. My response is pretty simple. We live in a community. A community is not defined by any individual life. So the whole, the whole point of, 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 of community is continuity. We reap the benefits of our forebears, we bear the burdens. And, and, and these sorts of historical racial traumas, part of the reason it's important to, to know about them is because they're not in the past, they're in the present. The trauma is real and it's present and it's traceable back to several historical events. So if we want to be the best community that we can be, and if we want to lift up and respect and value everybody in our community, then we can't ignore the fact that we have people who have been traumatized and have both um, subjective and objective manifest manifestations of the trauma. One objective manifestation of the trauma is the wealth gap. We know that generally African-American wealth is one-tenth of white wealth. Well, why is that? Well, one reason might be that there were some wealthy people in Tulsa at one point, a hundred years ago, and their wealth was taken from them. They were never compensated for that, right? So they couldn't pass that down genera generationally. So guess what? Yeah, there's a disparity in black and white wealth because these sorts of things happened uh, across the board. Slavery is another obvious example. Black, folk, black folks did a lot of work. They weren't compensated for it. The white people they worked for got, gained a lot of wealth and they passed it down to their children. 
Yeah. So that's that. You know, those sorts of things are hard conversations to have. We got to have them though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you mentioned um, John Holt Franklin Center's Reconciliation Park, and I enjoy taking my students there uh, pretty much every semester. And um, uh, and 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 I, I'm especially enamored of the way that it puts the events of 1921 in the context of this broader history that seeks to establish the the agency of uh, uh, black community members rather than simply casting them as victims or or simply defining their their community's life by by this one event. Um, it, it, it's somewhat disappointing that that it seems every year a large majority of the students say, well, we never heard about this growing up. You know, we never heard about this in school. Although I will say there seem to be less uh, cases of that uh, over the, the five years or so that, that I've been doing this. Um, how and why was the memory of these events suppressed for so long? And, and how did that change? How, how did that dialogue about the past start to come into effect? Well, there are a web of psychological dynamics going on here. So when this event happened in 1921, Tulsa was on an upward trajectory toward becoming the self-described oil capital of the world. So the business leadership in Tulsa wanted to minimize this event. It really besmirched the reputation of this city. They were positioning Tulsa as a cosmopolitan city. Uh, they really wanted Tulsa to be on the national and international map. Unfortunately, when you know a whole sector of your community is destroyed by fire, that's really not a good look when you want to be on the leading cities list. So they didn't want to talk about it, number one. There was a fair amount of shame in the white community as well, reflected in, in the newspapers. People who you know, bemoaned the fact that this had, this had happened and they hadn't acted and they hadn't done anything to prevent it. So there was shame in sectors of the white community. In the black community, there was PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. People were um, fearful and anxious um, and both physically and, and mentally disabled by this horrible event. Um, think about it, you lost friends and neighbors and, fam and family members uh, in a horrific Holocaust, essentially. That, that's incredibly traumatic. And some of the the, the survivors would, would talk about not wanting to burden their children with this. The fact that this might be something that, that is debilitating to their children. So they don't really want to talk about, talk about this sort of trauma to them. So it skipped generations for the most part. And there are three seminal events really that, that elevated the conversation uh, at the community level. One was an article written by a white fellow named Ed Wheeler. He wrote it in 1971 for a, a magazine. And that was the first many people in Tulsa had heard about uh, the, the massacre called the riot then. He actually got death threats for writing that, that article. Um, he was interviewed a couple of weeks ago by the Tulsa World. He, he's 83 years old now. He remembered um, making sure that his wife and child were, were moved out of the house uh, during this period because he was really frightened for the safety. People did not want him to publish this article. Then in 1982, a fellow named Scott Ellsworth, who's a professor of history at University of Michigan, he was a doctoral candidate at uh, Duke University under the tutelage of Dr. John F. Franklin. He did a dissertation. He turned it into a book called Death in a Promised Land. Scott grew up in Tulsa. And that book is probably the seminal book about the riot itself. Uh, even today. So that got a lot of attention, a lot of buzz. And then finally, the state convened a commission called the Oklahoma Commission to study the Tulsa race riot of 1921. The commission was convened in 1997, issued its final report in, on February 28th in 2001. It was charged with fact-finding with regard to the, to the riot or massacre as it's called now and making recommendations on reparations. And so this commission met during that period, uh, had hearings during that period. Eddie Faye Gates, a local historian, interviewed all the survivors that could be identified and located. I bet she did 100 interviews, and those are documented and housed at Oklahoma Historical Society. 
So that was a real turning point. It got international attention because if you'll recall, roughly at the same time, South Africa was addressing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and other folks were talking about reparations with regard to other uh, historical events. So there were international press here in Tulsa from Paris and from South Africa, from all over the world, literally. And the domestic papers, the New York Times, um, the LA papers, they covered the, these events as well. So that's really what elevated the awareness of this history. And that's been, you know, the commission stopped meeting, that's 20 years ago. And in the interim, a number of books, including the books that I've written and other people have written, a number of articles, documentaries, et cetera, et cetera, have been done on this history. So you mentioned the books that you've written and uh, two of them you know, stand out. I, you published uh, Black Wall Street in 1998. Uh, and then over 20 years later, last year, uh, you published Black Wall Street 100. I, I'm wondering what, what you've learned in that time period. Ha, has your perspective on these events changed at all? Um, it's not so much a change of perspective on the events. If, 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 if the event you're focusing on is the massacre, really the, the reason for the second book is, is to address what's on the minds of everyone who will come here for the centennial. And that is, how is the Tulsa of 2021 different from the Tulsa of 1921? In other words, what have you done to address your untended wound that was the massacre in 1921? And I think by looking at the book, people will be surprised at the various things that have been done, sort of sometimes in fits and starts, sometimes one step forward, two steps back. Um, it's what, what needs to be done to bring re racial reconciliation is daunting. So it's important to help people understand that whatever you can do as an individual or an organization is helpful to that process. That incremental movement is movement. That we're not going to change the world overnight, no matter how much we might want to do that. You've done a lot of these presentations, uh, and I'm sure, you know, beyond Oklahoma, you've spoken nationally and, and internationally, I would guess. Um, how have audiences outside of Oklahoma responded to your work? You know, I, I don't, there, there's no active resistance, first of all. I think people are curious and probably most curious about how this could have happened 100 years ago and so many people not be aware of it. For example, I've done a couple of interviews with the BBC and I did, in fact, I did an interview with the BBC yesterday. And one of the conversations was about how, you know, people, people in Britain don't know about this history. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And they're surprised that we don't know our own history. I think that that's, that, that's something that I get often. And when I'm talking, for example, to teenagers in Oklahoma, what I get, and particularly from white teenagers is this is wrong that we don't know this. We went to school here in Oklahoma. Why don't we know this? They feel cheated. Yes, my mother who lives in Germany now uh, asked me a couple of months ago if I'd heard of this Tulsa race massacre. So uh, yes, the, 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 the word gets out there and, and I, I think there is a different experience or a different perception of it from, from people looking from the outside. Um, I want to um, look at some questions that are uh, popping up on our um, question and answer. Thank you so much for uh, for, for, for your your patience uh, as as we uh, th 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 there's so much that uh, there's so much knowledge and and sort of really helpful informed perspective that uh, that you bring to this topic that we're lucky to draw upon. Uh, some of the questions I think I think they've they've been going up and and you've you've addressed some of them as you've gone. Uh, there's one here from uh, Justin uh, Ennis who says, uh, I'm a middle school teacher. Kids always ask about Dick Rowland and Sarah Page, and they want to know the rest of the story about the two people. 
Um, and he quotes uh, Randy Kriebel's book, Tulsa 1921, which states that Roland was removed from the jail during the, the night of violence. Uh, can you tell more about the story? Do you know uh, where, he was, uh, where he was removed to and, and what happened to him and what happened to Sarah Page? So we, I don't think anybody knows with particularity. What we do know is that uh, Dick Rowland ultimately was spirited out of town and he moved to Kansas City. That he, according to his mother, who was interviewed in 1972, he took a job at a shipyard in Portland and was killed in a shipyard accident. Dick Rowland's mother also suggested that Dick Rowland and Sarah Page were having some sort of illicit affair and that the elevator incident was in part um, a, a manifestation of the discovery of this illicit affair. It got out of, got out of control because uh, you know, a black man and a white woman having a relationship was taboo at the time and somebody found out about it and Sarah, Sarah Page kind of caved. That was what she suggested. We, I mean, there's, I, I can't corroborate that. I can only tell you that's what she suggested. Okay. Um, another questioner here asks whether any of the participants in the massacre were prosecuted. That's interesting. Nobody ever served time in jail for perpetrating the crimes against the black community in Tulsa. The police chief, John Gustafson, was actually removed for dereliction of duty. He didn't serve any time in prison. He had a, ne a next career as a detective here in Tulsa. The most curious thing about the whole uh, concept of prosecution is that several dozen black men, including J.B. Stratford, the prominent attorney and hotelier, and A.J. Smitherman, the prominent publisher of the Tulsa Star, the black newspaper, several dozen black men were actually indicted on the charge of inciting the riot. Um, and that makes sense when you look at what happened afterward, because the mayor, T.D. Evans, the city commission and others were calling what happened in 1921 a Negro uprising. So the idea was this was a Negro uprising. If they had risen up, then the mob wouldn't have destroyed the community. So we need to punish those black men who rose up and bucked the system. That was the philosophy. So I think there are two, there are two words that we have not used this evening that we must use. I think we need to be more comfortable using these words. White supremacy. White supremacy is really important because the guiding philosophy back in that period was white supremacy, meaning that Pure and simple, just, it, just like it sounds, white people are superior to black people. Black people need to be held in check, put in their place. That was the prevailing philosophy at the time in 1921. All right, and thank you, Chuck, for that question. A um, couple more here. Uh, one questioner asks how the Greenwood District fared during the Great Depression with having been rebuilt so close to that period of time. So I think. Uh, Jordan, who asked the question, is, is thinking about the massacre and then the rebuilding and then the depression hitting right away. Uh, how, did, uh, how did the community cope with that? I don't have a great answer, perhaps, but you know, one of the directories that I have a copy of, the business directories from the Greenwood District, is from the early 1930s. And it is chock full of businesses and enter enterprises in the, in the early 1930s. So my suspicion is while the depression worked a hardship on everybody in the country, this again was a And we seem to have lost uh, Hannibal Johnson just for a moment. Um, Peggy, I wonder uh, if we should uh, wait for him to reestablish a link. I don't know if you, uh, I don't know, have, uh, we seem to have fairly good weather here in, um, uh, in, in Tulsa. Uh, but uh, it could be the overwhelming number of people that uh, are online that are online. watching this, but we could go through some photos maybe. Yes, let's do that.
Okay, so this is Greenwood from 1918, one of the few um, images that we have of uh, Black Wall Street or, or Black Main Street, if you like, uh, from before the Tulsa Race Massacre. This is uh, Greenwood uh, from Archer, I think, looking north. So this is uh, the Williams family. Um, uh, they owned a number of businesses in Greenwood, including the Dreamland Theater and a, a, a garage, uh, a number of other uh, um, uh, enterprises as well. Uh, pictured here in downtown Tulsa, I believe. Um, this is one of the uh, images from the massacre. Uh, you can see Greenwood burning in the district and you see there uh, at least one uh, white man with a shotgun over his shoulder uh, walking around and you, you, see, uh, um, you, you see groups of men and women together uh, observing the spectacle. There's a number of these uh, images that are collected either at the University of Tulsa's McFarlane Library uh, or at uh, Tulsa Historical Society and, and uh, Museum or at the uh, uh, Oklahoma Historical Society amongst other repositories uh, that, um, uh, that sort of show these crowds of uh, white Tulsans sort of standing on the edge of the district and, and watching it go up in flames. Right. So this is, I believe, uh, uh, an image of a, a, a drive-by um, these are whites in a motor car. There are, there are um, many instances of uh, uh, um, groups of whites uh, driving in cars into the districts, uh, shooting anyone that they saw. Um, this started, I think, on the first evening um, as, uh, as sort of uh, small groups went across the Frisco Railroad tracks into Greenwood uh, shooting. Uh, and then it was followed by a more overwhelming and, and more heavily armed uh, groups of, uh, of men um, really uh, overwhelming the defenders of Greenwood. Okay, we have other, uh, other images here of uh, residential homes uh, going up in, in flames. Um, uh, as members of the, uh, the mob sort of attacked homes, uh, they would often go in, uh, loot items that they wanted to take, uh, destroy items uh, such as pianos, for example, that were maybe too big to take, but that they wanted to destroy, and then set the properties on fire. This is an aerial view. Uh, the term Little Africa was, was commonly used uh, in the white press uh, to identify Greenwood. Um, there were some other even, uh, you know, there were some other more derogatory terms as well. Um, the image on the left is one that's been memorialized in a statue in uh, Reconciliation Park uh, representing um, you know, one of the rioters there, uh, you can see uh, armed and, uh, and uh, on the streets of Greenwood. Um, you might imagine how a, uh, a young, young white man who has uh, been uh, told that, uh, that he is of a superior race, uh, uh, but isn't doing so well, uh, what he might think about this, uh, this sort of aggregation of wealth and, and affluence. Uh, and prosperity uh, uh, in Greenwood. Um, and then you see a larger crowd here um, observing and, and perhaps taking part in the, uh, in the looting and the devastation. This is, uh, I think this is the uh, AME church, um, uh, which had just been, uh, I believe had just been completed uh, six weeks um, prior to the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, it was brand new uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was set on fire. Uh, one thing, um, one story, and uh, we have a question here from, uh, from Trico and I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Hannibal Johnson this, uh, if we're able to reestablish contact. Um, one question was, uh, you know, North Tulsa burned, but was it actually bombed as some survivors claimed? 
And uh, I remember there was an account by B.C. Franklin, uh, um, John Holt Franklin's father, a prominent attorney who had only just arrived uh, in Tulsa prior to the uh, massacre. Uh, he reported uh, seeing planes dropping turpentine bombs uh, and uh, watching buildings uh, burning from the roof uh, rather than from the ground up and uh, citing that as evidence of, in, in, in support of this, uh, this notion that it was, uh, uh, that, that um, Greenwood was bombed from the air, from airplanes. Uh, that's something which, um, uh, which I, I'd be interested to ask, to, yeah, Mr. Johnson, what he thinks. Uh, I know that uh, some chroniclers of the past are more willing to, um, to get behind that interpretation than others. Um, I'm curious as to why that is actually. I know that in the HBO series um, that uh, that opens with the the Tulsa race massacre, uh, it, a fictionalized account of it, uh, it does portray uh, aerial bombings of uh, um, of Greenwood. My. Uh, more scenes of, uh, of victims of the massacre and then some uh, uh, trucks that were used to, uh, to recover bodies. Um, as uh, Hannibal Johnson pointed out, uh, many, um, the actual uh, number of dead was, uh, is very hard to ascertain uh, and uh, likely uh, much higher than the official numbers because of the ways in which uh, many bodies were reportedly uh, buried uh, or, or let's say, um, disposed of. Uh, uh, there has, of course, in, in, um, in the last two years been efforts to uh, use sonar technology to identify uh, or to try and um, confirm the presence of mass graves, unmarked graves, in places like Oak Lawn Cemetery and at other locations. Um, and, uh, and as uh, Hannibal Johnson pointed out, uh, many African Americans were uh, summarily rounded up uh, and escorted to uh, detain, uh, detention centers uh, in, uh, in uh, open areas of Tulsa, uh, leaving them um, uh, unable to defend their property, okay, and, uh, and um, forced to stay there until, uh, and, and even after the, in, even in the immediate aftermath, were required to uh, carry papers, uh, uh, or which, um, were evidence that they were authorized to be uh, out and about. And uh, here we have more, more images of uh, the ruins of Greenwood, okay, and uh, uh, victims of, uh, uh, victim of the massacre. Uh, and again, if you, if you think back to the pictures we had earlier of the, the houses on fire, uh, this is what, uh, what many of them looked like afterwards, really devastating. Yeah, I remember seeing this, uh, this picture the first time I uh, visited the Greenwood Cultural Center and uh, just being uh, uh, speechless, really. Uh, you know, it really looked like uh, the moonscape or, or maybe Hiroshima after the dropping of the mall. I mean, uh, absolutely devastating. Now this is a this is an image of uh, uh, Greenwood after the Tulsa race massacre. This is from 1938 uh, at the intersection of Archer and North Greenwood, uh, and you can see you can see how prosperous it appears to be, uh, bustling with businesses, with cars, uh, buses, and so on. Um, so yeah, we see uh, we see that uh, the rebuilding uh, took place, uh, revitalized the area. Uh, and even during the depression, which uh, in which this would have been in 1938, uh, still we have a, a bustling community here uh, once again. Okay. Hannibal, uh, I did not mean to uh, steal your thunder there with the uh, with the with the PowerPoint up. I uh, I That's wasn't you joined us, so uh, forgive me for uh, uh, for stealing your thunder there. Yeah, um, I got a message. I got a message that my status had 
had chains and it cut. I could still see you, but it cut me off. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't speak. Okay. Um, could you address that uh, question that Trico rose about uh, whether uh, Greenwood was bombed from the air, as uh, some survivors claimed? What's your perspective on that? Um, so my perspective is is not relevant, but 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 the evidence suggests that some sort of incendiary devices were dropped on the Greenwood community. There are a number of eyewitnesses, credible eyewitnesses, like B.C. Franklin, for example, the famed attorney father of Dr. John Hope Franklin. Um, he he talks about being. He was in the community. He talks about being um, where he could see um, planes flying over and dropping something on the community. The commission, which issued its report in February of 2001, concluded that privately owned planes did circle in and about the Greenwood community during the massacre, undisputed. There's no question about that. There's a high probability that at, at least one person in at least one of the planes strafed the community with bullets. There's a likelihood based on eyewitness testimony and other evidence that at least somebody in one of the planes dropped something on the community. Likely incendiary devices composed of either nitroglycerin or kerosene and some sort of other material that caused the firm, the, the fires to uh, spread more rapidly and burn more brilliantly. When you, um, you, you talk about the survivors, um, uh, memories and, and the work that was done by oral historians to, uh, to collect those memories. Um, when you read through the oral histories of the survivors, what are you struck by the most? Um, is there anything that surprises you? What, what, what is your, what have you learned from them that maybe we, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily uh, think of? So I was around in, in 19, in, in 2001, when the commission was meeting and when there were more than 100 documented survivors, I met a number of the survivors. Uh, what struck me, I think, more than anything was what they wanted. And what they wanted was to be humanized. What they wanted was people to know what they went through. What they wanted was for the stories to be told. They weren't clamoring um, at first blush for cash payments or anything like that. They wanted a voice. That's what, that's what most of the ones that I knew wanted most of all. Thank you. Um, I have a question here about um, uh, the, the, uh, the question uh, Jordan asks, what are the repercussions felt today because of the massacre in the black community in Tulsa? So I don't, I, I'm not sure, but you, you've talked a little bit about Greenwood and its future, um, although it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very different space and, and, and neighborhood and community than it was there. But, but are there other repercussions felt today because of the massacre in, uh, in the black community in, in, in North Tulsa? Now that can be addressed in two, at least two ways. One is you might think, what might the Greenwood District have been had it not been for this disruptive force? So might the Greenwood community have been what Atlanta is today, kind of a black business mecca? The question is unanswerable, but it, it's, it's worth pondering. The other thing that I would say in response to the question is that I talk about there being a gulf of distrust between the black community and the white community, particularly white authority. And that, that, that gulf really is not illogical or irrational. I mean, when you have a community that was destroyed um, and you have people in authority, police officers, for example, deputizing the, the mob who destroys your community, even though it was a hundred years ago, that kind of trauma translates intergenerationally. When you have a mayor after the community has been devastated talking about the Negro uprising, that trauma transcends generations. When you have a newspaper, the Tulsa Tribune, three days after the massacre, June 4th, 1921, publishing an editorial entitled, It Must Not Be Again, that has intergenerational traumatizing effects. 
when you have a Tulsa Tribune in that editorial, which, which says, and pardon my language, it's vile, such a district as the old nigger town must never be allowed in Tulsa again. It was a cesspool of iniquity and corruption. When you have a newspaper, a popular newspaper read by community leaders that spews venom like that, that, that uses such vile language against a part of the community, that trauma is real and lasting. And so the casualty in all that is trust. Okay. We are coming close to the end of our time. So I, I wanted to end with uh, one question, a, a question of my own. Um, what advice would you have to a college student or an alumnus learning about this history or the detail of this history for the first time? Uh, what might they um, take away from this? Well, you know, I'm a big fan of adages. And there's an old adage that says, when you know better, you have to do better. So once your eyes have been opened, it's impossible to close them again. And you have agency, you have the capacity to make a difference, albeit perhaps an incremental or a small difference. So there are things that, that you can do uh, to advance the lessons of this history. Uh, one is to get to know yourself better and understand your blind spots and your uh, biases, both explicit and implicit. There are a number of tools online that you can use for that. You can support organizations that you know are doing this work, the work of race and reconciliation. There are a number of organizations in this community and every community. You're probably represented by somebody, somebody on a school board. You can encourage your school board member to make sure that the history that we teach is a people's history of the United States, not simply um, a sort of um, sanitized version of history that doesn't include the history of people that we might consider to be marginalized or minority, if you want to use that, that, that term. You're represented by somebody at the local, state, and federal level, somebody who has the capacity to help eliminate the disparities that we have in this country around race, disparities in economics, housing, health care, education, all indicia of well-being, we have racial disparities. What are we going to do about that? The people that you elect should be addressing those questions. And you have the capacity to put pressure on them to make sure that they are. So there's a lot you can do. Some of it is very simple, almost passive, and some of it is more active and aggressive. But what you can't do is nothing. That's, that's what you absolutely cannot do. Hannibal Johnson, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, insight, your research, uh, your experiences with us. Um, your book, Black Wall Street 100, An American City Grapples with Its Historical Racial Trauma, uh, is available at NSU's Riverhawk Shop Bookstore on the Tahlequah campus. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Peggy Glenn, uh, Executive uh, Director of um, Alumni Relations. I hope I got that title right, Peggy. Sorry if I executive. Sorry, I do beg your pardon. I'm I'm I am um, confusing your title with Daniel's. Uh, executive Director of the NSU Foundation. Thank you so much for the work that you've done in uh, helping facilitate put this together. And to members of our audience, really appreciate your interest. I wish you all a good night. Thank you. Bye bye.